So let's begin with three illustrative examples. The first example will be in transportation. That we, I feel is, is highly relevant to uh, the climate change discussion. The second is on the food environment. And the third is on mental health. In transportation, we're going to begin with a research question. And the question is, are we asking the right questions about the ethics of autonomous vehicle testing? So there's a lot in this question. First, we're talking about ethics. Second, we're talking about autonomous vehicles. And third, we're talking about testing. We hope that you can get a little bit more insight into this when I show the next few slides. This was uh, from a pilot grant awarded by um, the Exploration of Practical Ethics program at Johns Hopkins. And uh, my collaborators were uh, Drs. Jonathan Esani and Govind Prasad in health policy and management. So here we see what is known as a causal loop diagram. And it shows the impacts of autonomous vehicles into the society. So I'll, I'll be more specific about what I mean by that. So we begin on the left with investment by industry. So that's the, in the uh, autonomous vehicle industry. And we use AV to uh, represent autonomous vehicles. And the first step is in AV trials. So here's where we actually test the autonomous vehicles. And the purpose of the AV trials is to develop safer AVs, which as shown in this diagram towards the middle. The step after that is AV production. And after AV production, then we hope that there's market share, high market share, so that consumers actually use the AVs. And the intent is to improve traffic safety. Of course, the entire motivation here is that AVs are supposed to be safer drivers than humans, and hence traffic safety will be enhanced. There is one difference between this diagram here in that there is an arrow going from AV production back to investment by industry. So this forms a loop, and this loop is very important from the industry perspective because when the AV production ramps up, then there's profits which the industry can put back into developing safer AV vehicles. So here we see that in, before we can actually go and put the AV into real rural traffic, we have to put them into test neighborhoods. And in order to do this, the industry would want to make sure that the neighborhoods were able to handle the AV traffic. So there may be some advantages to the neighborhoods. For instance, they could improve the inf infrastructure within the neighborhoods so that the AVs could navigate them more easily. While this seems all good, there may be some unintended consequences. So for example, if the infrastructure is improved, then this would increase the usage of AVs. And with higher AV usage, there would be a reduced quality of life because of the traffic. There would also be reduced traffic safety. And in this diagram, I'm showing this with red arrows, showing a negative effect of this increased AV usage. And finally, with this high traffic load of AVs operating in improved infrastructure, we're going to actually get increased emissions. I could keep going, with the AV example, but I think we're going to move on to the other two examples. Next, we're going to look at the food environment. Here, the research question is, what is the impact of the urban environment on weight gain in school-aged children? And here, we're looking specifically in inner-city Baltimore. This is one of many of the system science projects that was supported by an NIH center grant to Johns Hopkins University. And I really like the title of the original RFP from NIH. And that title is Systems-Oriented Pediatric Obesity Research and Training Center of Excellence. And the acronym is SPORT. And the key word there is, of course, systems. And in this RFP, they specifically asked for engineers to work with public health scientists 
in trying to understand the root causes of obesity using a systems framework. This project was 10 years ago, and this is where I first started to work with the School of Public Health on systems research. In this particular project, my collaborators were Drs. Joel Gilson in the Department of International Health and Dr. Tom Glass from the Department of Epidemiology. Here I show a snapshot of an aging-based model. In an aging-based model, where we have our simulated individuals interacting in an environment. And the purpose of such models is to find out how the environment would influence the health of the children or other simulated individuals. In this case, the individuals are school-aged children, and the environment is inner-city Baltimore. And you can see here a map with food sources, the streets of one small neighborhood of Baltimore, recreational areas, the school, and some of the homes. So the agent-based model also has a set of controls, and they are shown here in this dashboard, which was developed with my colleague, Dr. Joel Gittleson. Here you can see five sliders. The first one is about the quality of the corner stores, where the quality refers to the healthiness of the foods offered at these stores. The second one is the calories burned at the recreational centers when the children visit those centers. The third is the killer calories per distance for walking. And the fourth one is the probability that a child would visit a grocery store. And the fifth one is the probability that the child would visit a rec center. These controls can be adjusted. From the point of view of an intervention, the top control is the most important. Because if an intervention improves the quality of food offerings at corner stores, then we will move the slider to the right. And then we would see the impact of this change in quality on the simulated children. Here we can see a more advanced model with many more sliders and also some graphs showing a trajectories where in the horizontal axis is the age of each child and the vertical axis is the BMI. So we see here many lines overlapping each other, where each line shows the trajectory of each child with a span of years as they live in this environment going to and from school during the school days of each year. Next, I'm going to show a video showing this dashboard in motion. So here again is the purpose of the model. And we're going to zoom in to the neighborhood. And uh, we can see, the uh, as before, the various steps of the model. And then we'll see the animation on the map of Baltimore. So here you can see the children with different color codes showing them going to and from school and also going to the various food establishments. Then we're going to transition to some of the sliders that appear on the bottom and on the left. These sliders uh, represent the effects of the interventions, which can be switched on and off, and some of the parameters, such as pricing. On the right side of the model, we can see these graphs. So the horizontal axis represents time and it's a period of five years. And uh, the vertical axis represents the uh, BMOA. So what we're going to do is we're going to run the model. We don't need to see the animation on the map. But we're going to instead track the ages of the children over time, where each one of those trajectories represents one child in the model. Finally, we go back to the animations again, and you can see the children going back and forth uh, on the map of Baltimore. So this agent-based model was not purely an academic exercise, but it was actually a tool we used to engage with Baltimore City policymakers. Here we show a focus group meeting, and we also show some of the council members who joined the meeting. In this case, we see Councilman Bill Henry and Councilman Pete Welch. 
The goal of these meetings was to provide evidence to support an urban agricultural tax credit bill. So this was presented in City Hall, and on May 12, 2015, Mayor Rawlings Blake signed the bill, and we see part of the bill shown here. So I just wanted to show how an agent-based model could actually influence policy in Baltimore City. The final example is on mental health. And here, the problem is about community violence against children. The research goal here is in designing a multifactorial intervention to reduce child violence. And we are at the very first stages of this work. It's funded by USAID and World Vision. And the PIs are Drs. Paul Bolton, who is in the Department of International Health, and Teresa Wallace, who is in World Vision International. We chose two sites for our model. The two sites are in El Salvador and Honduras. And in this video, you'll see part of this model building process in the capital city of Honduras. I just wanted to show you a glimpse of our workshop in Honduras. Um, you can see the translator there, and the, the three youth here are actually from the neighborhood that we are studying. And they contributed quite a bit to the model, giving us insights that would have not been possible if we were not at the Honduras site. Here I want to show how systems modeling can serve as a tool for participatory research. In the center here is a causal loop diagram, and in the center of this diagram is the problem of interest, community violence against children. The arrows pointing into there come from factors that influence this basic problem. There are factors such as drug trade, impunity, violent adults, and so on. Then there are arrows that emanate from this central problem, which are the effects, including suicide and adverse child experiences. On the left are the youth of the impacted neighborhoods, and they're the ones who really understand what is going on within their communities. And on the right, you see the researchers from Johns Hopkins and World Vision. And the way that they communicate with each other is through this diagram in the middle. So the factors that impact or are impacted by community violence against children are expressed by the youth, and the researchers figure out how to place them within the diagram. And through this process, we develop a causal loop diagram of the phenomena happening in El Salvador and in Honduras. And we will move from that to what is called system dynamics models.